Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a fine Thanksgiving. And for those of you not in America, I hope you had a nice week. I had the mother-in-law in town the last four days. It kind of preoccupies one's time. Not a lot of time to sit around and talk about jazz. Unfortunately, I did get to watch a couple good documentaries about jazz. But uh, <clears throat> holidays are always kind of a mixed bag. All the same, good to see everybody. Glad everyone's okay. I want to give a shout out to my friend Neil Bilton up near Newcastle in uh, the UK. Hope you're feeling better, my friend. It's, uh, it's a crazy time, man. <clears throat> Appreciate all those, uh, you know, cats like you. And I hope you feel better soon, my man. Uh, so next I want to talk about briefly a recap of my last episode. Uh, only one person complained about it being a non-jazz episode, which generally when I do something that's not jazz, I get a lot of nasty comments like, oh, well, I, I don't come here for, <clears throat> jazz doesn't exist in a bubble. Everything is kind of interconnected. And it's an interesting topic that created a lot of good dialogue. <clears throat> we got well over 100 comments, which uh, that's pretty good for a channel my size. But uh, I was going to share some of my thoughts and opinions on some of the comments that were made. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it's pretty clear that there's no consensus. There is no obvious choice for the greatest American bands. And I do think Beach Boys and Metallica still end up near the top of the heap in spite of all the great suggestions and comments. Um, <clears throat> being a guy, a guy that was raised in hair metal and come through the thrash bands and the hair bands and uh, the priest maidens, you know, all those bands, that was my childhood. I maybe undervalue some of that, perhaps. Although I see value in Maiden and Priest and Sabbath that I don't see in the next era of American hair bands. The Rats, the Motley Crues, the Guns N' Roses. <clears throat> that being said, I think Appetite for Destruction is one of the greatest rock and roll records ever made. But it's such an anomaly. They made one record, and then they made a couple of Elton John sounding records. <clears throat> and they've been just kind of a, a fizzle in the pan ever since. That can't be the greatest band of all time. Appetite Destruction makes you think this could be the next great American band, but they certainly didn't live up to that billing. And <clears throat> none of the other hair bands are just, again, maybe I'm jaded because I will live through that, but most of it's such banal content. Uh, blatant ripoff of the blues often and just rhythm and blues and <clears throat> I was amazed listening to some of those bands now how much of blues structures a lot of these bands use at times. Bands like Cinderella, bands like Wasp, I was blind in Texas like it was, it was as a blues. I'm like, I didn't know this at the time as a kid. But you know everything kind of is interwoven. The fabrics are very intertwined. But for my money, there's not an American hair metal band aside from maybe Aerosmith in the 70s, who's in this conversation. You know, I think Aerosmith has definitely elevated themselves with the length of their career, <clears throat> the number of hits they made in their later years, and the great rock and roll records they made in the 70s. Uh, someone mentioned Alice Cooper, someone I had not really thought of before. Uh, I'm a fan of Alice. I like his early stuff somewhat. Uh, <clears throat> his 80s stuff was very poppy, saccharine. You know, poison in my veins. That was, that's heart. Another band someone mentioned who I've never been a fan of at all. Can't stand heart. Never, never jive with me. Uh, people mentioned MC5 a couple times. And kick out the jams. You're going to put that next to Ruby Tuesday and A Day in the Life. And mentioning MC5 leads me kind of to the next, the CBGB groups. Talking Heads I'm a pretty big fan of. <clears throat> I don't put them anywhere near the Beatles, Stones, Pink Floyd, Zeppelin, Pantheon, but I do like Talking Heads quite a lot. Uh, Patti Smith, the Bl Blondie, it's corny to me. You know, I DJ Blondie somewhat, some a couple of her tracks, and I just think it's real corny, schlocky stuff. The Ramones got brought up a lot. And boy, it's something that I don't get it. 
I have a few Ramones records. Uh, they pretty much all sound the same. The songwriting is childish. And that's kind of what its intent was, you know. But it's, we're talking greatest, not just a band you love. And again, I, I'm not a big punk rock guy, period. Once you get beyond the Clash, uh, which again, Clash knew how to write songs, knew how to create melodies and hooks. Uh, Blitz Creek Bop's not a hook to me. You know, and it's just kind of fun and rebellious. But we're talking greatest. And I, if, you're, if you're willing to say that the Ramones are the greatest American band of all time, I think A, it's a pretty big insult to most American bands. And B, it says a lot about what the American music landscape has been the last 50 years. I think it's a pretty sad indictment. Uh, a lot of people mentioned pre-60s stuff, and that's a different era. We weren't discussing that. Uh, I, I love Buddy Holly. I love Elvis. I love, you know, that era of stuff. <clears throat> but it's there was a gap when that music died and rock and roll kind of returns. And we were definitely talking 60s classic rock forward. And most of those bands were kind of ripping off the black R&B cats pretty directly. Uh, and Elvis wasn't writing his own music. Uh, I think Buddy and the Crickets were to some degree writing their own stuff. Uh, Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran. I like a lot of that stuff. It's fun. I DJ it. Uh, it's just not really comparable to me to the Beatles, Stone Zeppelin, Floyd, Queen era of stuff. <clears throat> Different era. Uh, obviously, the links and the connections are there. But uh, the next thing I want to mention is there's a few bands that are kind of solo acts, but kind of also bands. Springsteen and the E Street Band. But not all of Springsteen's records are E Street Band records. I don't think uh, Born in the USA was. I know there's a couple other ones that were not E Street Band records. And so, and how much does the E Street Band stuff, how much do they write as a band? Is it just Bruce Springsteen? bring a song to the table. Another one was Tom Petty, who I've mentioned a few times in, in discussions, but didn't in my video. Uh, my two favorite Tom Petty records are Wildflowers and uh, Wild, Full Moon Fever, both of which don't have the Heartbreakers. Those are my two favorite Tom Petty records. I love Full Moon Fever. I think it's fantastic. I think Wildflowers is a nice companion with a bit of a different tonality to it, but I do have several of the Heartbreaker records. I think they're fine, but I don't think they're uh, anywhere near the status of Strawberry Fields Forever. You know, I don't think they're anywhere near 2,000 Light Years From Home or <coughs> Us and Them or Stairway to Heaven. <clears throat> and I think one of the most important factors for me in this judgment is can most people name a couple songs at least? And if that's not the case, I don't think you can even suggest that act. To be the greatest band of all time from your country, it has to be kind of a ubiquitous thing where most people can name a stairway to heaven. You know what I mean? Cashmere. People can name dozens of Stone songs, Beatles songs, uh, Pink Floyd. There's, those bands all have very ubiquitous songs. Uh, <clears throat> I think The Doors and Credence both make a stronger case now having done this episode I do think the Doors have a lot of songs that are very ubiquitous and very uh, omnipresent in pop culture Jim's still very much an icon and uh, same goes for Creedence a lot of their songs are very much staples still of classic rock radio and you'll, you'll hear Fortunate Son in any film that's trying to talk about the 1960s you'll hear Fortunate Son so Creedence <clears throat> in spite of their short career and the Doors as well in spite of their short So yeah, I think the Doors and uh, Credence have kind of elevated themselves up on that list a little bit, having heard some of the feedback. But one of the main points of that exercise was to illustrate how there's not really a great number one. And you wouldn't be crazy if you said Metallica was it. You wouldn't be crazy if you said Aerosmith was it. You wouldn't be crazy if you said the Beach Boys were it. And, uh... I guess you don't put you could put Springsteen in there. You throw Bob Dylan in the mix, who never really had a band. He was pretty much the sole songwriter. And that's the other thing. You need to have songs that people know, but you also kind of have to write as a band to, on some on some level to be a band. 
you know, if that's not how you're doing it, you're not really a band, you know. So <clears throat> it's uh, neither here nor there. It was just a fun thing to do before Thanksgiving. And ultimately, it kind of drives home the point that the great American music is black. You know, it's the jazz, it's the blues, it's the rhythm and blues that became early rock and roll. Uh, even Chuck Berry, Little Richard, kind of the foundations of rock and roll in a lot of ways, along with uh, guys like Louis Jordan and Ray Charles and Tiny Bradshaw. There's, there's cats that were really helping Ivory Joe Hunter that transition. But uh, R.L. Burnside, no, no, sorry, not wrong guy. Uh, the guy who Elvis bit a lot. I can't think of his name right now. Tip my tongue. But uh, anyway, great stuff. A lot of great feedback and comments. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just uh, interesting exercise. And I think a lot of people did do what I expected, where you go, oh, that's easy. It's, And then you go, oh, shit, that's UK. That's UK. That's UK. That's <clears throat> Anyway, uh, today I want to talk real quick about... Thank you, local siren. We need that here in a small town. 1,200 people on a Sunday morning and we got a fire truck it looks like makes a little interesting color right uh, this is a great underrated record right here we three uh, Phineas newborn Tennessee native fantastic pianist a very dynamic player uh, Roy Haynes of course is one of the great drummers and legends and then the big man there is Paul Chambers who uh, gets a lot of room to stretch out on this record which makes for a very fun trio setting <clears throat> all three of them have lots of room to be expressive and emotive but what i wanted to talk about today was my favorite john coltrane record i talked about my favorite miles davis record and again you want to go with the trendy pick you want to go with uh, <clears throat> how sophisticated i am i'm going to pick this pick but i actually try to measure it by what what have i what do i pull out the most what do i listen to the most what do i still listen to the most I think that for me is kind of how I'm going to measure this little series of, of, of episodes. And so for John Coltrane, it was actually a little bit easier than Miles Davis. With Miles Davis, there's a lot of records I like, a lot of things I don't love anymore. So it's kind of a, I had to go through some different thought processes. Uh, kind of Blue could have been my choice quite easily. I still play it quite a lot. But I've talked about KLB and most people most people have talked kind of blue to the blue in the face so I figured we kind of skip that one and I think uh, the one I chose someday my prince will come is a fine uh, <clears throat> replication of what miles is at his pinnacle great stuff beautiful ballads the Harmon mute a great band around him transitioning uh, <clears throat> I like the fact that it's not the Coltrane show on every track. Mobley's got a nice tone. Uh, it's, it's an interesting transitional record, which, again, with jazz, most records are transitional. Not, not a lot of guys sat down and made the same record over and over and over through their whole career. Some guys did. But <clears throat> when it comes to Coltrane, uh, my favorite Coltrane record, that's changed a lot over the years. There was a number of records I felt could legitimately be that choice and I almost went with Johnny Hartman Coltrane because I love that record and still listen to it a lot but as time has worn on I actually like the, the Hartman uh, I just dropped by to say hello even more than the Coltrane Hartman record uh, I think Illinois Jack Head is just brilliant on that and soft and minimal and again Coltrane still always kind of pushing the envelope even when he's bridled he's still kind of striving and Hartman wasn't enough to really restrain him and I love his Blue Note album you know Blue Train I like some of his really prestige work but none of it's my favorite Coltrane <clears throat> his Atlantic work is seminal and, and has some very important stuff in it I love Giant Steps if I'm feeling kind of an aggression and uh, some mathematics it's very complex but still quite listenable uh, the blues a couple of the records on Atlantic are fantastic but when it came down to it, the record I probably choose to DJ the most, bring to my shows, and I listen to probably the most at home, ends up being Coltrane and Ellington. And I'm trying hard not to get my episodes demonetized because I need to make some money doing this. <clears throat> that open refrain there. 
in a sentimental mood. What Hartman couldn't do in order to bridle Coltrane, Duke Ellington could. And you're not going to hear Coltrane in a much more contemplative and respectful approach to songs than here with the giant Duke Ellington. And it doesn't really matter what era of jazz you're from. Ellington is held in high esteem. He's the canon. He wrote so much of what is jazz. He stretched the borders of the fabric in every direction you can imagine. <clears throat> A lot of what Ellington did is bigger and grander than the limitations of what jazz are. Jazz is kind of rooted in swing and rooted in improvisation and comes from a very black tradition. And, and Ellington pushes those boundaries consistently and never really liked the name jazz for what he did. It's, it was his music. Uh, he hated the term jungle music, which it was called in the 20s. Ellington's career is so important. And the esteem he was held in by everybody in the jazz universe is universal. It's, there's not a lot of detractors when it comes to John Coltrane. Uh, you had a hard time being a working jazz man and not playing with people from the Ellington universe. He had so many people come through his band over the years. And so, <clears throat> while I like the Hartman Coltrane record a lot, and I think some of those renditions of those songs are seminal, fantastic versions. If I had to pick one record to introduce someone to John Coltrane, and one record to say this is probably my favorite most listened to John Coltrane, it's probably this Duke Ellington record. And it, it, Coltrane's respect for the giant is pretty present. <clears throat> Coltrane seems to have a gate on him where he's being a little bit more conscious of, oh, it's my time. Okay, let me do my thing. And he's more saying, okay, oh, it's my time. How would Ellington want this to sound? What does the song call for? And I think part of what Bebop and Parker and that modern era of jazz established was you could completely abandon the song and the chords and the melodies and just play from your soul and your spirit, which is fine and dandy. But when you're playing with Ellington on Ellington's compositions, that requires a bit of a different level of uh, respect for the music. And Coltrane definitely shows that in this setting. Uh, interestingly enough, Bob Thiel, I think who organized this, I'm pretty sure, yep, uh, <clears throat> didn't tell them which rhythm section to bring. So they ended up both bringing their rhythm sections. So you got Sam Woodyard here, Jimmy Garrison, Elvin Jones is here, Aaron Bell's on the bass. Uh, again, just some of the great legends of this era of the music. And you get to hear Ellington's compositions in a fairly stripped down setting, bass, drums, piano, and, and Coltrane. And uh, the, the different rhythm sections take different turns. Uh, for me, My Little Brown Book and In a Sentimental Mood are two of the greatest 60s jazz tracks. They're just fantastic, beautiful, melancholy. Uh, so there's a spiritual essence to them. Again, you have two spiritual giants. There's elegance to it, uh, sophistication, which Ellington always brings to the fore. And so you get to hear Coltrane in a place where I don't think Coltrane showed Miles much respect. There was no fear factor. Coltrane didn't quiver in his boots around Miles the way a lot of people did. And I don't think he gave a shit what Miles was saying or doing. He Coltrane was doing Coltrane's mission. And <clears throat> not very many people could bridle and change that course. And Ellington's one of the few cats who you can say he really put a block and Coltrane really became sensitive and listener and became aware of the composition and the song and that had showed the song some respect. And there's nothing disrespectful in some essences of stripping a song away and re reinventing it completely. That's also part of what jazz does. But you hear Coltrane here very much trying to state the melodies and um, he wants to honor 
this man who's probably 30 years his senior. Uh, <clears throat> most guys, like I said, when they played with Miles, were very concerned of winning Miles' approval, which was a very difficult task in and of itself. I can't think of another setting where you hear John Coltrane with more of a pause, with more of a hesitation, with more of a, oh, I better do this right. I know there's infinite ways I could do this, and that's part of what his process always was, is I could do it this way, 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 and I ended up playing seven choruses because I thought of seven different ways to do it. And so he doesn't just choose one or what he thinks is the best one, he tries them all. That's Coltrane. He's always kind of just digging. And that's part of why you love him. That honest seeking integrity, <clears throat> that's what Coltrane is about. But again, with, with Allington in that piano seat, I think, I'm not saying he trembled in his boots, but he shows a great deal of reverence for the song, for the comp composer himself, and for Bob Thiel and Impulse. This was probably an ideal setting for Coltrane. And Ellington does make a couple of records here at Impulse uh, at this point in 62, 63. Uh, Creed Taylor's already gone. Uh, Coltrane ballads is from the same era. And for me, ballads, Hartman, and Ellington <clears throat> are three pinnacles of Coltrane's career that aren't as the growth process, which he's doing at Prestige, the expanding the horizons, which he's doing at Atlantic, the going over the horizon, which he does in a lot of his other Impulse stuff. Those three records for Impulse, he's saying, okay, I'm gonna give you some stuff that's going to be accessible and enjoyable for people. And they sold fairly well, I think, but it's hard to find any of them in an original pressing that's are in decent shape. I see ballads all the time, beat the shit, I see the Ellington one numerous times beat the shit. I have a reissue of it from probably the 90s. Uh, sounds just fine to me. And again, it's such a beautiful set of tracks. I do want to flip it over, play a little bit of my little brown book. There's just such a wonderful, what's this? Uh, the bass. Ellington has such an ability to paint clouds, paint mood. Uh, his minimalist tinkling makes you realize that sometimes that's all it needs. It's all that's called for. And there's Coltrane once again playing a very lyrical, contemplative. Uh, respectful sound that's reminiscent of a Ben Webster, a Coleman Hawkins. And Hawkins and Webster are alive in guys like Rollins and Coltrane and Dexter Gordon. You know, though that's the lineage, no question about it. But Coltrane is very much consciously influenced by those guys, but he's also always kind of creating his own new territory. And this is a place where Coltrane's connection to his past is very present here. And the, the balladry of a guy like Webster, who could just put such a sentimentality that's not just sugary, that's not just corny. It's got a power and a, a real emotional setting that can move you. The Brute is something special. And here you hear Coltrane doing his best Ben Webster, doing his best Coleman Hawkins. And I think that's an important aspect to recognize is that for even a Coltrane, this is the highway. This is the road that this music was built on. And he knows it. And I think that we talked, me and Ken, about if you could add five years of Clifford Brown or to John Coltrane's career, which would you pick? And for me, it'd probably be Clifford. But I would have loved to have heard Coltrane have come back to the blues, back to the center of the road to some degree, <clears throat> which the thing that makes that not possible was he knew he was dying come 64, come 65, 66. He knew his health was deteriorating rapidly. 
And I think that's part of what, as I've said many times, that's what's pushing him out there. And if that sentence hadn't been hanging over his head, as it were, I think he would have interspersed more sounds from the middle of the road those last few years. But if there was no finality, and if he had the horizon endless ahead of him, I'm sure he would have made a lot of great stuff into the 70s and the 80s, which just wasn't to be. So, again, it's not an easy pick, but for me it was easier than the Miles pick. Duke Ellington, Coltrane, that's probably my favorite John Coltrane record. It's one that pretty much stays in print. So if anybody should be able to find a pressing of this of some kind and just soak this in and recognize that even Coltrane's, even guys like that, know the roots of this music are here. And you'll seldom, if ever, hear Coltrane playing this hallowed music with more of a sacred prayer to the music itself. He's always praying from his own place of existence to the cosmos. And here he's talking about the sanctity of the church of jazz. And knowing that this is one of the great apostles, prophets. Ellington's just so important. And even a guy like Coltrane on the mission that he was on took the time to unfasten his seatbelt, step into this bit of a slower moving train, and get all aboard the Ellington Express. And sometimes I think a guy like Coltrane would have benefited had he had some time in Ellington's band. I think anybody who played with Ellington learned how to use composition to improvise without completely eschewing the melodies and the songs. Uh, again, it's Ellington's compositions. You don't want to mess with them too much. And so that's my pick. And uh, curious to hear what all y'all favorite Coltrane records are. There's a lot to pick from. You know, I think I have probably 75 Coltrane albums, and that doesn't include all of his side work. That's also fairly infinite in the 50s and definitely disappears come the 60s. But Coltrane, another place I love Coltrane, honestly, is, is Blue Note side work. When he's at Blue Note and he's around guys like Sonny Clark, those guys were strong, strong senders. And another place where you hear Coltrane kind of adapting and grafting himself to another group of people is when he's at, in the Blue Note stable. He's definitely on Blue Train, on Sonny's Crib. He's on the, on the Johnny Griffin stuff. He's definitely being part of that hard bop sound in the purest sense of what that hard bop sound was. The experimental sheets of sound, prestige stuff, that's him going through the exercises, almost practicing as he's taking these songs at times. It sounds like a rehearsal. He's just trying ideas. And when he's at Blue Note, his ideas seem very concise, precise. He's kind of funneled into that aggression of these young men. He's become part of that clique, as it were, and they're saddling up and mounting up. And so Coltrane conforms himself <clears throat> to the Blue Note hard bop sound in 57, 58, which is one of the only other times I can think of where Coltrane's really kind of conscious of the players around him and really allowing that to impact what he does. There's times where on the Miles stuff, he overplays to some degree. And he can't help himself. He just got so many thoughts going through his head, so many ideas, so many ways this could be done. But and, and it only kind of made Miles sound more milesy, more minimal, more melancholy. Miles four notes versus John Coltrane's four hundred notes. It kind of enhanced what Miles was about. And I think Miles liked that. You go do your thing. This is going to make my, what I do even more effective. And I think that's why him and some of the other players he worked with, Miles, didn't jive the same way. Guys like Mobley. <clears throat> so, again, Coltrane's such a giant. He's such a fierce force of nature. There's not going to be a lot of compromise in what he does ever. So, aside from the Blue Note records, this record here with Ellington is probably the greatest example of him listening and conforming himself to the composition and the players around him. And he doesn't really step out of line whatsoever on this record at all. You see, it's very much 
within the lines while still delivering some really brilliant and inspired blues-based improvisation. Wonderful stuff. And you realize that when you hear this record that Coltrane could have had a whole another career had he chosen to, where he could have played in the lines, he could have played the blues and melody, and it wouldn't have sacrificed any of his insincerity or spirituality whatsoever. You can still be a very spiritual player playing within the lines. But for Coltrane, I think the biggest impetus for where he went and why he went there was he was searching for the answers and searching for meaning, searching for if music could give him purpose and meaning. And beyond the limitations of jazz was the next horizon that he had to cross before he crossed that final horizon into the afterlife. And so he was definitely the coincidentalness of the time frames when his health starts deteriorating how his music changes I don't think you can separate those two things so anyway simple episode uh, again the rock and roll thing was fun and I don't think the Ramones could possibly be the greatest American band of all time if you do nothing wrong with that but you're putting that against a day in the life you know uh, I don't think it's very objective and it's speaking more about how much you like it, I think. But, again, it's a tough thing to do. Opinion, uh, it's hard not to speak from where you love, obviously. Uh, again, if you appreciate the channel, please go to Patreon and help support if you want. Uh, or also go to the merchandise store and grab a hoodie or a t-shirt or a coffee cup. Uh, y'all have a great week. I'll make another episode probably Monday or Tuesday. We'll talk to y'all soon. Love y'all. Y'all be all stay safe. This is another COVID variant coming. Let's just stay strong and vigilant, guys. We'll get through this. Blessings. Peace, guys.